Bon, merci pour l'invitation, merci pour être là. Je fais le remerciement en français, après je vais changer en anglais probablement. Peut-être que je fais un peu aller-retour entre les deux quand j'oublie. Euh, Photo System 2, euh, c'est l'enzyme de base, euh, photochimique, et c'est peut-être le plus compliqué. J'ai l'impression, et je pense à la fin de mon exposé, vous, vous, tous vont avoir la même impression. Mais on va voir si je peux clarifier certaines choses. Maintenant, uh, voilà. In the beginning, um, if I can get this to work, is that correct? No. Yes. In the beginning, there was no oxygen. Um, and it was photosynthesis that put the oxygen there. And it was when photosystem 2 evolved uh, that it put the, photos, put the oxygen in the atmosphere. And when it put it into the atmosphere, there was so much oxygen around that it allowed bioenergetics, the conversion of energy in life, to be so much more efficient and things could get complicated. So when the oxygen got to a sufficient level, then we could have respiration. Respiration is very efficient at moving energy around, and so life went from being unicellular to multicellular. Um, what was actually going on uh, was this photosynthesis, this is what's going on then after that, because respiration was around, photosynthesis was putting the energy into the biosphere in the form of reduced carbon, I've written it here as sugar, but reduced carbon and all the building blocks of life um, and putting oxygen into the atmosphere and, and taking CO2 and combining it with uh, water to, to make these products. Respiration is the reverse of that process. And it is, while photosynthesis was putting the energy into the biosphere photon by photon, then respiration takes it out again and uh, in, in useful biological sized chunks, which is ATP in a sense, um, which is being generated by respiration so that life can then work. Um, that went on beautifully for a long time, but it was a, it was a cycle during a long period. It was a cycle that was, was very asymmetric in that the biomass accumulated and was not used up by respiration. Instead, it was laid down in the oceans and in the peat bogs, And in the peat bogs, it became coal, and in the oceans, it became petrol. But also, there was the brown stones, the shales, the tar sands, and all the rest of it that's gone into the earth. And while it did that, working asymmetrically, it pulled out the carbon dioxide that was in a high concentration in the atmosphere and stuffed it into the ground. Now, clever humans found it about 150 years ago and have decided in the blink of a geological eye to stuff it back into the atmosphere. And it's the biggest problem that we have now on this planet. And um, I will say that although photosynthesis made uh, change the planet, made life work the way, put the, the fuels into the ground and all the rest of it, photosynthesis is not going to save us from... Um, this, this problem that we have because I personally believe that biofuels are far too inefficient because photosynthesis is far too inefficient. So don't put your bets in that department there. If you do that, you will only accelerate the loss of species, the loss of forests, and the destruction of this planet. I hope I was clear. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, water is very stable. Oxygen is, is relatively unstable. In fact, it's much more stable than you'd expect um, because of all the energy that it's got in it. And that stability comes from the fact that it's a triplet state and it needs to change spins to react. So if the, if the oxygen was not a triplet state, then the atmosphere would spontaneously combust. But nevertheless, it's got a lot of energy in it. And that energy is available for respiration. So it's very hard to oxidize water. And it's very favorable to reduce oxygen, which is this is why the energy is taken out in respiration and put in by photosynthesis. The solar energy is taken in to do this process. This is the reaction that occurs in photosystem two. 
Here's Photosystem 2 itself. This is a little cartoon that I tend to draw in the system. This is terminology. Um, we, talk, we call it Photosystem 2 and lots of various different abbreviations, which I don't like. Um, what it actually is is a water plastoquinone photooxidoreductase. That tells you what it does. This tells you what it does as well in a chemical way. Two molecules of water are oxidized, two molecules of plastoquinone are reduced, and oxygen is released. What Photosystem 2 is trying to do is to get electrons, that is to say, to reduce plastoquinone. Um, but if you look at the thermodynamics of what's going on here, most of the light energy has actually gone into the formation of the oxygen. So what Photosystem 2 is doing by accident, it's getting the electrons which it needs and it's going to use to fix CO2 later in photosynthesis, but it is, as a side effect, charging up the atmosphere with energy. And that's mainly what it's doing. Photosystem 1 is doing the big reducing question. But the Photosystem 2 is producing oxygen by accident. And that's where most of the energy is going. What, I've, what this rest of this picture says is that this enzyme here um, is in a membrane. And electron transfer takes place across the membrane. Um, you've got uh, the water splitting photosystem 2 part on the inside, you've got the quinone reduction on the outside, and you've got the photochemical part in the middle. We can go a little bit further in terms of the thermodynamics, and we can divide the big equation into two parts, two half reactions, the one I was talking about before, which is hard to do. It requires a lot of energy to do that. The midpoint potential, or the reduction potential, is about 820 millivolts. But at f under functional conditions, it's harder to do that because it's at pH 6. And this is how much energy is re uh, required to do that. This is rather an oxidizing process. It's very difficult to pull the electrons out of water. The quinone reduction is rather easy to do. It's not a very reducing reaction. To take the electrons from water and put them onto the plastoquinone is what the whole it's what the whole enzyme is doing. And if we look at the energy difference between these two values, that's in this, in, it's about um, 700 milli electron volts, that should be. Um, and then if we do that under functional conditions, it's even bigger than that. If you add the fact that the electrons are crossing the membrane, you get nearly another 100, uh, close to 200 um, milli electron volts are required for pushing against that. And overall, about one electron volt is stored or is required to actually get this. Uh, to That's what you get in your chemistry after you've turned over photosystem one, excuse me, photosystem two. And the energy that's required is the, phot is the photon, the red photon, which has got the energy of 1.82 electron volts. So we get well over half um, if that worked. Um, efficiently, we'd be getting well over half of the energy of the photon required in that. Um, right, so this is the green stuff. Many of you have seen this slide before. I can't help showing it. I did it when I first moved to France and I got invited to give a talk at the Rotary Club of Dompierre. And I thought they might be, I should give them something they'll understand. So I got as far as drawing this and then everything went to hell. But anyway, here's a leaf and in the green stuff, um, the green stuff in the leaf is in the cells, and in the cells it's in the chloroplast, and in the chloroplast it's in the membranes, and in the membranes it's in the proteins. And there are two kinds of proteins that carry the green stuff. Those that do light collection, and those that do the conversion of the energy of light into chemistry, the reaction centers. And it's the reaction centers that I've spent most of my life working on, but I'm interested in the antenna these days, which is funny. I never thought I would. Uh, the green stuff in these systems is uh, the big aromatic molecule with the magnesium in the middle, which is chlorophyll. Here's how chlorophyll works. If you keep going down, this is the last orbital, occupied orbital in a chlorophyll. And the first unoccupied uh, molecular orbital corresponds to the energy difference of red light. So red light, when it's absorbed, kicks an electron up to the first excited state. And it will be up there, and this is the special thing about chlorophyll, for ages, that is to say about five nanoseconds. This is very long for this kind of system. So you can do something useful in that time. 
Um, if you don't do anything useful with it, it'll come back as either as heat, go back down again, or as fluorescence. It's also got another excited state further up, which can correspond to the absorption of blue light. If it goes up to the blue light level, it instantly comes down, instantly, femtoseconds down, to the first excited state where it, was, where it went up to if it, was a, if it was excited by red light. So the energy difference is lost. It absorbs in the blue, it absorbs in the red, it does not absorb in the green. The green comes through or bounces back and hits you in the eye and you say, ooh, that's a green molecule. Um, so if you look at this green molecule and it's in its excited state, we don't want to lose that energy if it hangs on for longer than five nanoseconds. We want to do something useful with it. In the light collecting proteins, it is lined up with a whole bunch of other chlorophylls, close by, almost the same color. And what happens is um, there is an excitation transfer process that occurs, um, which happens, which, so it, the excitation energy jumps onto the chlorophyll next door to it, and there's a whole manifold of those chlorophylls around, and in the five nanoseconds, they share. So basically what's going on in an antenna protein, you just need to get your molecules close enough together, all the same color, and it will share, so it harvests. One photon comes in, hits a, a surface of 200 molecules of chlorophyll in a manifold, and it will bounce around between those in the five nanoseconds, and then it will lose it again as heat or as fluorescence. You don't want to do that. How do you do something useful? Well, you make sure that it, you've got different kinds of proteins that have got the chlorophylls organized in such a well, chlorophyllite molecules, close enough so that instead of doing excitation energy transfer, they do electron transfer. So that's what's going on here is there's a difference in redox and there's a difference in how these things are coupling. And so the, what happens is you get this fundamental thing occurring at the heart of the photosynthetic reaction center in that it, electron transfer takes place forming a cation radical and an anion radical. This is very oxidizing, it wants an electron. This is very reducing, it wants to give away an electron. Why don't they go back together again? Well, that's what the photosystem is being built to avoid. It just keeps on pushing them further apart. So here's back to a picture. Views of photosystem two, this is the one I'm gonna talk about. I usually draw this. I call this the cuddling beans structure. Cuddling bean structure is because th this, when you look at it, you can see it's symmetrical. It's symmetrical because it's evolved from a homodimer. This is a heterodimer. These two proteins, D1, D2, diffuse proteins, are um, actually almost purely symmetrical to each other. They have changed over time. It is a pseudo-heterodimer, and it's specialized so that the, react the charge separation takes place on one side, the water splitting takes place on one side, not on that side, and the storing of how the quinone reduction works, because it's a complex two electron process, is specialized in this bit as well. But it started off as a homodimer where it was the same on both sides. That's clear that that's the case when you think of its evolution. Um, but another way you can look at these is to look at them in this way. This is what I call the hexagonal view. Um, so you can, you can, it turns out that Photosystem 2 looks exactly like France. Um, and um, and uh, I won't go into the fact that it's very weird that the iron is where the Eiffel Tower is and all, and you can teach this to a French audience uh, in terms of uh, main roads and, and cities, but I won't get into that, and possibly things coming in from Germany, but I don't want to get into that. And this side of things, we've got, uh, this is another view now which you get much more commonly, which is the excess spaghetti view. That is to say, we know what the, how these proteins are now. So you can put up pictures where you can see nothing but pretty colors. And you could even put in all of them, dozens of cofactors in here to confuse people even more. So I don't think that's a lot of use either. We'll go back to the cuddling beans. And we go back to the cuddling beans because despite the fact that, uh, that in the spaghetti, it's this one, D1 and D2, are wrapped up in this bit in the middle here, then all the important things are there anyway. So we don't need to look at the rest of that complexity. When we look at this, I've talked about water splitting this side, quinone reduction that side, two different kinds of enzymology and photochemistry in the middle. You've got essentially six chlorophylls in the middle, these two on the outside, and these are doing light harvesting in the main, and a bit of photochemistry, but not, but in a bit of chemistry, but not much. 
The ones in the middle, the four in the middle, form a cluster with the, the pheophytans. Pheophytans are the free base of chlorophylls. That is to say, the, mag the magnesium's gone and been placed by two protons. And this makes this a good electron acceptor. It's lowered the potential. So that when you excite this system, um, the pheophytans pick up the electron. How does it work? Here's how it works. So we put this on a free energy scale a standard free energy scaling. We'll look at the cuddling beans down here. And P680 is a generalized name, an old pigment name, saying that bleach occurred at 680 nanometers. And that's all it means. And these are all absorbing close to 680 nanometers. So there's no big deal here. It's not very specific in terms of a name, which is why we change things to be more specific. And this is a photon. It, should be, it could be a red photon or a blue photon. It excites the system up to the first first excited singlet state, and we could say for the sake of argument it's got 1.82 electron volts. And then charge separation takes place. The charge separation takes place between this one, which is called chlorophyll D1, and the pheophytin. But I've drawn it in this way so to avoid fights, but also because the first thing that you can properly resolve is a radical pair where the cation is on this chlorophyll here, which is called PD1, and the electrons on the pheophytin. So this one is actually two separate electron transfers, and one from this chlorophyll to there, and then an electron from this one to there. But the first thing you can see is this radical pair here, which is the PD1 on there and the pheophytin. That occurs in picoseconds. And then there's a stabilization when the electron goes from the pheophytin to the quinone to stabilize the charge pair. That's why it doesn't come back, one of the reasons it doesn't come back. And then the cation, which is formed on here, is oxidizing enough to rip an electron out of a tyrosyl, out of a tyrosine, which is close by, tyrosine Z. It doesn't throw its proton away. The proton stays very close and hydrogen bonded on a base. We'll see in a minute. Um, and then the tyrosine is oxidizing enough to oxidize this manganese cluster down the bottom here. And then electron transfer takes place across the uh, in the parallel to the membrane between the two quinones to stabilize, to form a, the last state. This state here, we call this to uh, QB minus, and this state is formed in about uh, more than 90% on a flash, um, and it is formed in a millisecond, and it's gonna be now stable for 30 seconds. And so we've, we've done good chemistry here. Um, Here's a more accurate uh, value of the fruit. So we've measured a lot of things since I drew that first picture. This is a more accurate view. The energy gap dropping down from fear fight to QA is not as big as I drew it in the previous ones. We know what that is now. It's more like three, 350, 370 milli, uh, milli electron volts. Uh, but it's still a big stabilization step. Notice that the, the drop downs, the big drop downs are electron transfer on the electron donor side. We're losing reducing power, but we're not losing oxidizing power. That's really important because this is an enzyme that wants to oxidize. It doesn't care about the reduction because it's easy to reduce quinone. So we can throw that energy away to make it work in the right direction. And what's going on here is this is the amount of energy that's thrown away to get this to work in this direction. And I can draw an, another version of that. Since it's doing four, uh, two electrons on that side, four electrons on this side, what this means is that actually you get intermediates that recombine. But once you average out all the electron transfer steps, there's four of these, they're all slightly different. You average them out, then the amount of energy that's gone into the chemistry is this much. And the amount of energy which is thrown away is this much out of the 1.82 electron volts. And this is really quite important. That thrown away is not a waste. That thrown away is to get things to work. If it was exactly the amount of energy you needed to have things uh, stored away, nothing would go in that direction. You need some push in the system. This is what we call over potential driving force to get the system to work. So this is the, the, the heat that's done that, is to achieve the high quantum yield of charge separation, to give you the driving forces and to avoid back reactions, because back reactions actually kill this system. And I give another very long talk on that subject, which I'll avoid. And for this talk, what's important is that some of that heat is required to get water oxidation to work and to release the product, to release the oxygen from that. 
and we know all the other things. I mean, we've measured now the energies for releasing the quinol and stuff in this system. Um, just go back, have I got anything? Yeah, just so this is a take home message. Photosystem is too is squeezed. These processes are compromised. If you had more energy, it would be more efficient. You would get, more, you would get less damage and you would get a higher quantum yield. But this system is stuck. It's working maximum for the energy that's available. It's not perfect. This, unlike all the other photosystems, it's working at about uh, close to 90%, perhaps 88% quantum yield. The other ones work at 100%. This one can't do it because its job is too difficult. It has to split water. It's got a lot of energy requirements to do this, and it's inefficient. And as a result of that, it picks up all this damage and stuff. And that's one of the reasons why everything out there on the planet is actually working at the same place. It can't go to longer wavelengths to pick up the massive amount of infrared, near-infrared uh, pro uh, photons that are there to drive the system. It doesn't work very well. I'm working on that. There are two very obscure versions of Photosystem 2 that work in the infrared, and they have problems. That's why it hasn't taken over the planet. It would be too easy. And this is another uh, take-home message. There is no such thing as a free lunch. OK, that's a different lecture as well. So how does Photosystem 2 do one electron chemistry and get it to interface with multi-electron chemistry? What it does is, and we've, I mean, again, I work on the quinone side, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the donor side here for, um, for your benefit. This is the estate cycle stuff. And this takes us straight back to Pierre Joliot. So Pierre Joliot was the first person to develop methodologies and make the measurements of water uh, splitting in a flash by flash. He had a system, and if you know Pierre Joliot, then he always uses non, um, what well, he uses, living systems. I think that's because he's a rubbish biochemist. But I think that it's also because he's really very interested in living things, and he wants to study those kind of things. And one of the things that he developed was a special instrument which was able to measure oxygen evolution very rapidly. And if you give it a flash that was bright enough to hit all of your photosystem twos in your living sample, an algal sample, and, and excite them in one shot, and then turn it over and then hit them all and only hit them all once, then you can get this kind of synchronization which Mark was talking about at the end of his talk. Special thing about photoenzymes is if you let them dark adapt, they can get to a synchronized state, and then you can turn over the enzyme flash by flash. That's why we work on this stuff. It's the most fun enzymology that there is. And Pierre Joliot was the person to demonstrate this in Photosystem 2. Got this amazing observation that on the first flash, there was no oxygen evolution. On the second one, there was no oxygen evolution. On the third one, there was a big amount of oxygen evolution. And then it took four more flashes before the peak came round, four more flashes before it came round. This is four electron chemistry. That's not a coincidence. A model was then developed by Bessel Koch, which we call, call the, the, the Koch cycle or the, the estate cycle. And this is the fact that you get this strange three electron stuff, the, the third flash effect. That's because the stable state in the dark is mainly this one. This one where one charge is already stored. And we know the reasons for that now. But basically, it's starting in the S1 state, then going around in a cycle like this. And oxygen is being evolved when the S4 state, which is spontaneously generated, is formed. And, and uh, people, this is just a drawing where we know now the protons don't come out all at the end and stuff. OK, so how does water oxidation work? Let's get into that. We, well, we've got lots of questions. Here are some of them. You can look at them yourself. You don't need to talk about them. But we need to know the whens, the wheres, the whys, the hows. That's what we're after. We're going to look closely at the redox cycle for water oxidation now. I've drawn it in this weird way with two S zeros. And that is because I think it really does exist as two S zeros. That is to say, there is an S zero with oxygen bound. It hasn't been resolved uh, because the oxygen comes up very fast. But there's going to be an S zero with oxygen bound, and it's released uh, during that time. But this is the standard cycle. These are the electrons coming out. What's this about? I mean, this is just to say there's been a huge amount of work done. Everything in the book has been thrown at this enzyme to try and figure out what's going on in the Koch cycle. What are these things? Um, 
And what we did a lot of was EPR. EPR was the dominant method for about 20 years. I mean, from 1980 to about 2000, it was the dominant. It went out slightly when crystal, crystallography came in, um, but now it's back. It had to come back when the crystallography got good enough to be able to test mechanisms, because you need a way of testing things. Lots of these other things have provided huge amounts of information on this as well. So the role of manganese, if you can say, people knew that this corresponded to manganese, because in the old days, if you didn't give it manganese, then it didn't make water splitting. You fed it manganese, it worked. You hit the system, the manganese fell out. You knew the manganese was in there. But in 1980, it was discovered using EPR that the S2 state was um, a multivalence uh, manganese, high valence manganese system. So that meant really we knew it was involved in this process. Um, and this is just why manganese. Why, why manganese? Well, there's a lot of it around. There are many redox, redox transitions. The potentials of manganese when it goes from like three to four, and also actually from two to three, the potentials can be in the order of about a volt. And that's the kind of thing we're looking for, for these kind of things. There are many different redox uh, states in it. Manganese 2 is mobile and weakly bound and redox inactive. It goes to higher valence. So when it goes to higher valence, it spontaneously picks up waters. These are waters without the protons, oxo groups. But we can have them with the protons. And that means when you go up and down in redox states, you can spit out protons and compensate the charges. This is really all good stuff for manganese. It can go to manganese 5. It doesn't. I don't think it does in the, in the enzyme, but it can go to manganese 5. It goes to more like this kind of thing in our enzyme. So there was all good reasons for why our manganese is there. So let's look at what's going on here as we go through the estate cycle. We know now that in the, in the, lowest, potential, the lowest potential form, we got uh, three manganese 3s and manganese 4. And then when we go up, we pull an electron out, spit out a proton, and we, we oxidize another manganese up to two manganese 4s. Then we get them to... S2, we've got three manganese 4s and manganese 3. When we get to S3, we have four manganese 4s. Strangely, when we get to S4, well, it's complicated. Not that strange, but certainly it's complicated. What has been observed, and this is really crucial, and it's a big problem for studying this enzyme, is that the manganese 4 with the tyrosine radical is got exactly the same lifetime as the release of the oxygen. So the electron transfer takes place as oxygen is released. That is to say, kinetically, all the interesting and complicated stuff that's going on after you've excited the S3 state is all hidden in there because the rates of reaction are too slow to allow you to detect intermediates. And that's been known for a very long time. Okay, we're still, but it gets pulled apart a little bit because we do know there are lag phases. Lag phase was discovered by Fabrice Rappaport and it was then followed up by Holger Dow. And the guys, there's a lag phase in, after the formation of the tyrosine in the S3, uh, in the presence of the S3 state. But still, there has been no other um, intermediates detectors as you go through the complicated chemistry of ripping the water apart and spitting out the oxygen. Um, yep. So that was what happened there when we got to that, when we got to, <laughs> we got to S3. It actually all happens in one shot and in a black box because we don't know what's happening, essentially. That's what that was about. Um, and then, uh, so here's some features of the enzyme. The most oxidized state, two molecules of water are oxidized and four electron, in a four electron process with no detectable intermediates so far. Um, the other oxidation steps are all the enzyme going oxidized. Manganese goes oxidized until the manganese and the tyrosine goes oxidized together. And the next thing you see is the oxygen comes out. The charge accumulation steps are compensated by proton release mainly. Nearly everyone's compensated by that. That's a big deal. I've drew the protons on there. It's really quite important. If you didn't compensate the charge, then the potential would be different on every step. And it would just be hugely wasteful and wouldn't work. Um, substrate waters are exchangeable in all states, except in the tyrosine Z dot S3 state. And this was demonstrated by Alan Boussac's amazing experiment where he 
he exchanged the calcium, which you'll see later, exchanged the calcium and the chloride for strontium and iodide and slowed down that last step from one millisecond to about 40 milliseconds or more. And so you can work on it and you can see that there is no water exchange during any of that time. There's water exchange in all of the other estates. A uh, completely amazing experiment. We did it with, uh, took those samples to a messenger who did the mass, uh, did the mass spec on that to demonstrate that. Um, so here's the story. So four electrons in one shot, that means you've avoided all these nasty intermediates that are in between. If you look, if you're trying to oxidize water by one electron, then you, you can't do it with any of the oxidizing powers that exist in biology. You simply can't do it. Um, you might be able to do a two electron thing, but that's pretty far, and that's actually still too much for the kind of oxidation powers that we have in photosystem two. So basically, you've got to do this by storing up four and then doing it on average in one shot, if you can, as close to one shot as possible. These, you, you've got all the midpoint potentials and everything, I won't go through it. The bit is, this is the idea. So instead of trying to climb up these mountains, and then there's some downhill stuff as you go from superoxide to oxygen, you try and do it as equal as possible. If you were designing this yourself, you would make all these steps equal. That would be the most efficient thing you could do, biggest driving force with, because you're using the same oxidant on every step. It's still, it's, foot, it's P plus that's the oxidant on every step. This is how you do it. In actual fact, it turns out this, this is a smaller step and some of the, some other variations in the steps. But effectively, you can think of it being something like that. Why is this a smaller step? We don't know. I think it might be a redox lock thing to prevent the manganese going back down to manganese two. And that's really important because it's, it's for efficiency of the system. So that's really what's going on there. Um, you, you manage to get it to work in this way. Um, so you can, but we can also say that this is only possible by getting rid of the protons and compensating the charges, because if you really accumulated the charges, then it would just stop, because you'd run out of, because you'd be trying to put charges next to other charges. You've got to compensate, otherwise it won't work. Okay, then this, this is what I was telling you about. This is the, this is the, the rate limiting step problem I was telling you before. I don't need to go through that again. So we got some of, the, some of what's going on. Here's some of the questions that are being solved. When, we, when does water get oxidized? Right at the end, we know that. When is manganese oxidized? All the way through, up to manganese four. Uh, where is the, uh, what's the valence of the manganese? We know that, I showed you that. Is the amino acid radical chemistry not directly involved in water oxidation? Um, but it is playing an important role, we'll see in a minute. Uh, and then when does the substrate water bind? Well, we saw that stuff because of the, the, the Boussac experiment I was telling you about. Things are exchangeable all the way through, so it's binding and stuff like that, but it stops being exchangeable on that last step. But there's more information on that in a minute. So let's look at some more questions. So how does the water get oxidized, and what's the structure of the active site? So let's look at the manganese question. So history of this, just look at me timing. History of this is that um, there were some major spectroscopic methods that played big roles. And I can't, I've got no time at all really to deal with this kind of stuff, except to say X-ray absorption was important. Here's the things you could do with X-ray absorption that, 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 were, that would, came out of that kind of stuff that are quite interesting. Stuff about hydroxyl, uh, oxo, hydroxyl bridges on the S0 or S1 side, but Holger Dow did that. Um, there's different stuff in terms of what's going on. Again, the samples that were provided by Alan Busak to the Berkeley group where he's replaced with strontium showed that there was some structural changes around the calcium when you go from the S2 to S3 state. We already knew that from EPR, but they, they were able to demonstrate that by, um, by exas. This is, was important the, the, in terms of the X-ray absorption edge data, which tells you about how redox things were going on. But this was amb ambiguous as well, whether S2 to S3 was actually ox oxidation or not. Um, so certainly it was clear that S3 to S0 was manganese reduction again, go back round in the cycle. Um, EPR did lots of stuff, and of course we were involved in this in, in big ways. Um, there's so much that I can't really cover, but the point is that it turned out that S0, S1, S2, S3, and the, all the states, basically S4, which is tyrosine, which is S3, tyrosine, Zender, you could detect by EPR. Um, you spin half states for S0 and S2, and there were two the spin isomers in S2. The 
been isomers in S3 as well, which is, which is quite interesting. And a lot of this was done by Alan Boussac. Um, if you'd, lots and lots of groups were working on this, but in terms of longevity of what observations were correct, the majority, I would say, and I'm biased, but the majority are the ones that came from outer Sacre. And, and I th that is because um, it was cleaner stuff. We had better spectra and we had better control over the biochemistry than all the other groups. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, and um, so it's spin isomers for S2 and S3. S2 to S3 sensitive to light. This was a discovery of Alan Boussac and me working together on that. Amazing times where I'm like, how could this possibly happen when I'm, when I'm illuminating this system and we know it kind of, well, maybe it's photochemistry of the manganese. And I went away, came back an hour later, discovery of photochemistry of the manganese itself. Spin state changes demonstrated at low temperature. These are massively well known in iron chemistry, but were discovered for the first time in this enzyme. Um, uh, coupling scheme indicates that the uh, S2, in the S2, signals that the manganese are strongly coupled with three of them are strongly coupled and one of them less so. This is a Dave Britt thing. And that was really important because actually that gave some structural idea that three, it was a three plus one type structure. And that certainly is. And that was well before. Here's some of the EPR stuff that's going on. Um, this was discovered in 1980 by Dismukes and Sidra. Uh, we discovered, I discovered the, the G equals four and it was published at the same time by us and by the Berkeley group. Uh, this is the high spin state and it's spin five half and just G4 as Alain demonstrated by doing um, um, spin stuff, um, spin methods to, to, to determine what was going on there. Um, other groups worked on this a lot as well. And as I said, Brit's group came out with uh, the, the, the relationship between these will come out to that. We did things like give flash sequence, follow the Joliot experiment, but doing it with EPR, showing that these things oscillate with periods of four. That's what you had to do. This is the, this is the um, Dave Britt um, observation that you could get the low spin and the high spin form from this three plus one type uh, structure in the system by changing the valence around. And this has been the heart of uh, what's been done in the post-crystal structure stuff as well, uh, um, sorting out what's going on in terms of uh, spin states in the different S states. Um, so this is uh, EPR from the zero state was discovered by Messenger when they accidentally put methanol into the sample and it appeared, but we knew that it more or less had to be a spin or half state. Um, Alain did the uh, S-state type stuff on that, showing that the S0 state comes around when you'd expect it to come around. Um, EPR from S1 and S3. Again, Alain did quite a lot of the stuff. Alain Boussac did the, on that S3 state, got the full spectrum and simulated the spin state on that. And um, we did this uh, picture there. Now, these question marks here are a reflection of Manganese itself, it's, it's an ambiguous system for doing spectroscopy on in many times. And so you've always got possibilities that you can't properly rule out. And to rule out those possibilities, what we really needed to have was structure, real structure. And um, it took a while. So this is, these are the things that, were, that came out of EPR, but then the post-structural stuff helped a lot. We'll come back to that. X-ray crystallography kicked in. We started off with things which were really very poor, but it looks like a, uh, a funny shaped thing, but maybe it's a three plus one. That made sense. St there was not much information in the first crystal structures, but it was saying they're on their way. That was in 2001 from Zuni, from Witz Group. Um, they didn't have any uh, resolution of the amino acid side chains. These were just um, alanines in the system. This was no better. This was no better. The, when uh, Jim Barber, got a sort of force, and, and Soyawata got like a force fit structure to a system at 3.5, and this gave us some kind of information. This was something that Alan and I did when we were looking at that first structure. They had misassigned some density in this region here, which, which we knew couldn't be uh, bicarbonate, and we knew that, that it was more likely to be the 
um, substrates, and so we modeled in the substrates here, and so we could see that the distances were going to be interesting because it's that close from the calcium to the tyrosine. I would say the big thing about the first crystal structure, um, which first resolved crystal structure, the, the one from Barbara and Iwata, was that the calcium was unambiguously part of the cluster. Now, we had data for that from EPR, but it was still ambiguous. We were juggling, but the data was pretty clear. Um, we just couldn't say absolutely. This said absolutely, it's in the cluster. And that was the big deal from this first structure, as well as the distance to the tyrosine and its base, its histidine base. Um, so the first real structure, you know, the, the resolution was actually poor and it didn't really help. There were lots of calculations done. It's a poor structure. It didn't advance what was going on. And then, so they thought that we we're going to have to wait forever. But then out of the blue, after about four or five years working on this thing, uh, a structure appeared that was 1.9 Anstrom units. So things were resolved. That was a revolution. And what was the revolution? The revolution was we got the geometry, we got the waters, we got the, the, the ligands to this system. So it's really a, a, it's a different geometry from the one that was first published. This is like a distorted chair. The big deal here is that this, this oxygen in the middle here, which is the oxygen 5, actually these bonds are slightly too long to be proper bonds. And, and, the, and the cluster was reduced by the, by the X-ray beam to some extent. But even, not, even when it's not, then these bonds are pointing to this one being some, sometimes this side, sometimes this side, some, some sort of flexibility in this system. Um, that's just the, you saw that picture of Mark's thing, but this is just my drawings of this. What we got was the ligands, and you can see they're all, they're all carboxylic acids. They're all but one bidentate, and all but one are carboxylic acids, and the one that isn't is, is, a, is a histidine in this system. So here's your list. And there are four terminal waters and uh, numbered uh, one, two, three, four. And this number four, which is the one that, that Alan and I modeled in the first instance, that's hydrogen bonded to the tyrosine. Um, OK, so, so and we could see the chlorides as well, um, the chlorides in this system. We knew where the chlorides were. We knew there were two because of enzymology we'd done in my lab. We knew that those two were in these positions because Alain had replaced the chlorides with bromide and given them to Jim Barber, and they'd found the two positions for these chlorides, and so Shen verified those. Um, this is, there's more than just ligands. There's hydrogen bonds to this system from these here. So there's a bunch of hydrogen bonds at different places as well to the, to the oxo groups in this cluster. And there's lots of information now uh, in these beautiful channels that are going on in this system. There's a channel here. Uh, they've all got different names. Yeah, but they call them these names. They actually don't know. It's arguable that this actually this is one of the water in ways. And it's arguable that this is one of the proton this is coming to the oxygen four, and this one was uh, when I was working with Ishikita, we calculated that this was deprotonation on the S0 to S1 step. I'm not sure that's true, but it's, it was a beautiful uh, calculation that Ishikita did on that. And this one is almost certainly a proton exit um, under the conditions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So with this structure, then finally, the uh, computational chemistry that had been spinning their wheels for years on the wrong structures that didn't have enough, didn't have enough resolution to do anything, started to do things, and they kicked in big style. So you can look. So you can look at. I mean, obviously, when you've got a structure straight away, Shen was saying, "Well, maybe, uh, maybe this one's close enough to be uh, uh, making an oxygen oxygen bond, and maybe this one's close enough to make an oxygen oxygen bond. Maybe, you know, you could be speculating. And just about, it was about five different speculations in that first paper. Not very helpful, uh, but the computational chemistry could really do the thing. The numbers, when the, when the crystal searcher came out, were clearly wrong. They didn't fit with the spectroscopy. And so people then, the first year they came out, every single calculation group calculated their own structure, where they put it right because it couldn't be what they were published. Because, and this was beam damage. This was electrons from the beams essentially reducing those manganese. And when the re manganese reduced, things open up a bit. So people corrected it in their computers. And there was, you know, there was 10 corrected structures, probably. 
within minutes type thing. But the other way to correct it was actually to try and use less beam in the system. And they'd gone into that by doing XFEL, which is X-ray, um, X-ray, um, free electron laser. Yeah, so they, they basically it, um, I don't know if you know this, it's like the biggest and most expensive experiment in the world. They shoot crystals into a beam they flash them if they want to turn things over, and the X-ray, uh, the X-ray laser vaporizes the sample in about half a picosecond, and you've got to take all the data in the first hundred or so uh, femtoseconds, and they do that millions of times, and they manage to get a structure out of it. Sounds like science fiction, it certainly was, and it, because all the first papers that were in Nature were published because of the science fiction nature of the of the of the data. Uh, and uh, science fiction nature of the method, not the data, because they had no data. Um, it was only later that that kicked in. And now it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, amazing method. Uh, and we'll come to that later. But they started doing that in order to avoid the beam damage. And so that improved things and the distances became closer to those calculations before. So which, which, which manganese are going to oxidize? We know this in the structure. This is the one, it's the manganese 2 over here, which is the start, which is always manganese 4. You go through the system from 2 to 1, from S0 to S1, and um, then the next one that gets oxidized is the one on this side here, um, which is 3. I can't actually say, so I should have my glasses on. But this is 3, it's all done by memory. Honest. And then this one is the one that goes next when you go to S2, but this one has got this, this spin isomer thing going on. The spin isomer is causes electron transfer within the cluster. So it's going down, the manganese 4 is going between the 1 position and the 4 position, and there's not much energy difference between those. This is the, this is the high spin form the G4 signal we were talking about before, and this is the low spin form. It's hopping between those two, and that's really probably really important because it's in manganese 3 that you can do exchange rapidly with waters. Manganese 4, it's all locked up. So by having this hopping around, things can be changing. So waters can be exchanging under these conditions. Those are the substrates. The, uh, when you get to manganese 4, then of course all the manganese are, are reduced. Um, and then, of course, we, get, we keep going on. We'll come back to that. So terminal waters, uh, which are terminal waters, which are substrates? Um, there's lots of stuff here. MIMS, I'm not going to really go into. This is MIMS is this mass spec, kinetic mass spec, quite interesting. Uh, it puts limits on things. You can see two rates of substrate coming in by doing flashes and mass spec. It's very interesting. It's been done most recently, mostly by Messenger. But, uh, but, but recently they were saying, that, and you can sort of make choices on that, but recently they were saying that the kinetics are affected by changes in the channels to some extent. So the earlier limitations coming from exchanging calcium and saying that seeing how the rates were changed could be compromised by the fact that we know that when the channels get changed, then they could be changing the binding stuff as well. So, so the choices made based on the MIMS are a bit questionable these days. But if you combine that with some of the EPR, then they came up, um, they came up with some good answers. This again, this was Alain Boussac was providing uh, samples to Nick Cox and people who, who had previously worked in our lab and went to Lubitz's place where they've got these amazing instruments. And they did this fantastic kind of measurement, sort of LDO detected NMR with oxygen 17. They also have money. You can buy oxygen 17 in Germany. Um, and, and you could figure out where things are. And the, the, the take home was something which was obvious from the uh, first crystal structure that the important one is the oxygen that is oxygen five that's bouncing around. The one that's the one that's got the long, uh, it's got the long um, bond lengths and stuff. So oxygen five is considered to be one of the substrates. If that's the slow one, then what's the fast one? There are a number of possibilities. So this is oxygen five. We think that's one of the substrates. Um, and we think that it's uh, one of the possibilities that are discussed a lot is the, whether it's the water two or the water three. The water three was actually ruled out by MIMS, but we think this is the most likely one these days um, because I think that idea was wrong on the MIMS. Structural flexibility, I talked about that. This flexibility is an important thing 
to, to get exchangeability in your, of, with the substrates. And this is, I've talked about that again, it's the, it's the high spin, low spin stuff, hopping back and forward, opening and closing of the cube is one thing that's discussed a lot, and I'm not gonna go into that. There, are, there is also flexibility in S3. You see these three different kinds of S3s. Alan Bustak was, again, the person who determined there were two different, detect, two different kinds of S3 going on in the system. One of them is EPR detectable. He sent the samples to Nick Cox that allowed him to uh, sort out the structure based on that fancy kind of EPR and what's going on with S3. So there's a big focus on S3 and a lot of the experimental work has been done by Alan Bustak recently in recent years. And this is the most important stuff on that in experimentally, but there's a lot of focus on it in terms of uh, calculations. And this is one of the calculation things. And of course, naturally I choose the one um, that I was associated with, but it's actually, um, this is working with uh, Vili Kaila uh, in, in Stockholm. And this is going from the S2 to the S3, the S3 state. And this is done, the calculations have been done in high spin and low spin form and, and covering changes from low spin to high spin as well. But I just show you the simplistic one where it's going from the low spin form. Here's the open cube with the pendant manganese four on this side. The blue is the manganese three. Um, oxygen five is this one here. And that's the one that's jumping around. Here's the calcium in your system, and here's your bound waters. You've got water one, water two, three, and four. Four is hydrogen bonded to the tyrosine. The tyrosine is hydrogen bonded to its base, the histidine. And water three is in this um, hydrogen bonding network. And then what goes on if you do the calculation is if you put an electron on here and a positive charge here, which is what happens, then this influences the system so that the water three actually deprotonates. And it deprotonates through the hydrogen bonding system through to the other side and connects up to the outside and spits that proton uh, right to the outside via the aspartate 61 and the, the, one of the chlorides. And the aspartate 61 and the chlorides are involved in iron pair stuff, which actually shakes things around as you go through them and ends up pushing the proton out in that way. But anyway, that's what happens. And when that occurs, when this is deprotonated in the presence of the positive charge and the radical here, then this water three then swings over in the, ca the calcium and then binds onto the manganese three, which is over in the one position on the other side of the cube. And that's what you see it there, bound there. Uh, and that's what's happening in the S3 state, we think, uh, in this particular model. And people have hooked onto this because it seems like a great idea. It's just published in, in BBA in those days. And it's got lots of citations because it's seeming like it fits with lots of things. Um, so that's what I'm talking about there. Anyway, water oxidation, we do the same thing. So the same, calcu same calculation with Vili Kylo, we did the similar kind of thing. The next step, so you went to S3, it was all manganese fours. All of the environments of each one of those manganese fours were similar. They were all six coordinate and similar to each other. So this is what happened. That's what we got here, this structure. Um, and actually what I didn't say was that when that, when the water three moves across from the calcium and onto the manganese one, then water five, which is, was previously hydrogen bonded to it, moves in and takes its place on the calcium. So there's a shunt of there's just a swap over under those circumstances. So you see there is a water three position there now, but this is the manganese five that's moved, the, this is the water five that moved into this position. And on here, um, you've, got, um, the, you've got the water. So uh, the water that was, was the W3. We have a deprotonation here. We know now that's the wrong order. The, it's already deprotonated. It should be, that's just in the wrong place. It doesn't matter. The point is that when you get down to this bit, and this is, we've got the same, th man all manganese fours, the radical, the charge close by, these are really important. It does the same thing. Basically, the hydroxo on the water three, which is now bound to oxygen one, deprotonates, and it deprotonates right across, uh, right across the, um, the, the hydrogen bond network and goes out the same route as the one in S3 did. 
And so the calculation shows that pretty clearly. And then what's going on is that when that happens, then there's electron transfer takes place. And, and it takes place from that deprotonated water and it forms an oxyl radical. And the oxyl radical bound to um, manganese uh, four in the one position here is close to the oxygen five, which we know is the other substrate, right? So you can see the proximity is close enough for the oxyl radical to do its stuff and form a peroxo intermediate. To form a peroxo intermediate, peroxo inter intermediate is a two electron uh, intermediate in the system. The first electron is gone, forming the radical. The second electron comes from the manganese four in the system and forms the peroxo intermediate. And then having got the, per the peroxo two electron intermediate, then the other two uh, manganese in the system both um, go reduced and form the oxygen which leaves the system. And when it leaves the system, then the oxygen, the, the water five, which was the thing that bound onto um, the calcium, when the water three zipped across, actually then folds in and probably forms the next oxygen five in the cube. So we got these, we got these models which are pretty good. And this was 2016. The X-ray crystallography guy uh, came in, came in with the XFEL stuff, and they found the density that we were talking about um, down here next to the uh, next to the manganese one, but they claim it's still bound to the calcium in the circumstances. We didn't suggest that, but I'll tell you in a minute. But this is what they see on the S2 to S3 state, so they're not saying that the water three came down here, but it's one of the possibilities. It's certainly in this position. This is also the position that was suggested by Per Sigbaum in one of his early models, who also is the, is the big proponent of the radical mechanism in this system. Anyway, so there, this is this uh, predicted um, binding of a water to the, to the manganese one is now being detected directly in this system, okay? Um, and the, the reason they've, got, they've still got a ligand from the calcium to that um, oxo group here, um, hydroxo possibly under these conditions, and should be in, in our model anyway, is because the um, ligand changed on the calcium in that. So, uh, uh, the, you've, so you've got, a, you've got the, um, the glutamate 189 becomes very, very long. Essentially, it deligands from the system on that step and goes back on again. And this is what's being seen in this time-resolved X-ray stuff. So this is fitting our models to some extent. Um, this is them. So they also, based on their X-ray stuff, they came up with various different possible formations of the oxygen-oxygen bond, and one, one of them is the one that we suggested, of course, but other people have suggested it too. Um, but anyway, the point is that the structures don't define the mechanism, the calculations help. So this is, that's, the, that's our model, essentially, where we think that the, um, what, we th what we take to be the oxyl radical, which was started up here, moved down in S3, and that the oxygen-oxygen bond is forming between five and, uh, and this uh, oxyl radical there. Um, so that's just the picture. That's the one I showed you before, which I think is good. There's, there's another article which we're writing, I was working on it on the train, with Vili Kyla, which is the next uh, phase of this, which is where the, elect where the protons are going, and these uh, iron pair stuff for getting rid of the protons. Um, what we want to do is, I mean, this is great. This, the, what we're saying here is, I said before, we can't measure these intermediates because of the rates. These intermediates are being calculated. They're presumably all occurring um, at, at rates where you can't detect them because they're not the rate limiting step. And so what's going on here is that it's great and we can put forward these models and some of them make a lot of sense, but how can we test them? And I think this is the big question now, is to find testable features of these models. And so what we desperately need is more uh, real experimental stuff, taking the crystal structures and the 
and the calculations into account and saying, what can be done? And those kind of things are the kind of things that Alan Boussac has been doing. And those are the kind of things that we desperately need more of instead of everybody shutting down and doing a calculation in the privacy of their own clothes, which is what's going on. We need to be in the labs. We need to be messing with the enzyme to try and slow things down, modify it, get into the intermediates to see what's actually going on. So I, th I believe that that is the future. That has to happen. The calculations will give us the answer, but we won't know which one because they'll give us 12 different answers. Um, so what have we learned about water oxidizing? Well, I could stop now if you like, but I just want to give you this background thing. Take homes. There's redox compensation. You lose protons from your system as you accumulate charges. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. That's one thing. You do four electron chemistry. We, even the models are saying it's four electron chemistry, but two by two in a very short period. But that's how you do things. You don't get partial oxidation, partial, and they're hanging around. That's not what's happened. These are two reactive as intermediates. Everything happens in one shot. So effectively, it's four things in one shot, and that's how it works. Um, and f yeah, you get a four oxidation of water and a four electron reduction of the catalyst, and that's how it works. And it's not a coincidence we've got four manganese in there, but as you saw, we're not oxidizing all the manganese. It's a sort of buffery thing. Um, and multinuclear manganese, it only goes as far as manganese 4, it doesn't go as far as manganese 5, and you've got the radical in there, we believe. The role of the calcium in there, this is really important. It's clear, these models are saying the role of the calcium is substrate delivery. Um, it's not redox active, obviously, it's a calcium. But what it's, what's special about calcium is that calcium are big fuzzy things in terms of metals, and they can do coordination in all different directions, and they can have many numbers of coordinations, and that's perfect for this kind of enzyme. You bring waters in here, you give them down there, without being stuck in a hard uh, coordination sphere, which is locked up. Calcium's great for that. Take it here, give it there, do that. I'll take another one. I won't. It's, it's, that's what calciums do. It's doing exactly that in this system. We suggested that, I suggested that in 1989. It was providing the substrate to the enzyme. That's what we're seeing in the system. Now, there's another thing here is why, don't, why, why do you need to provide the substrate to the enzyme in this way? The enzyme is sufficiently oxidizing to partially oxidize water at those lower redox states. You don't have to go to manganese 444 to oxidize water. We said going from manganese 2 to manganese 3 is a bolt. You can do those kind of things. We don't want to do that. We want to do it at high valence so that when you've oxidized them all, you're only going from four to three. That's why you've got four manganese in your system. But you don't want to have oxidized the water too early where you form those intermediates. So if you've got, if you're going to, if you allow the substrate to get in too early, you will get premature oxidation of the system, formation of peroxide, other problems like that. Your manganese will go back down to manganese 2 and 4 out because that's soluble. You will have huge inefficiencies in your system. It's really important to keep those levels of the reduction level of the manganese up. They all stay solid. There's not much movement going on with them. There's a little bit of movement going on within them, as we saw, but not much. And, and uh, you can do four electron chemistry without everything falling apart. It's clear that that's the case. The calcium is to keep the substrate water out of there until you're ready to put it in. And it puts it in at the right moment, the S3 state. But already in the S3 state, you don't get any reactivity until you trigger it by the deprotonation, which is due to the charge effects of the tyrosine and its base, which is so close to it, which triggers those deprotonations. That triggers the formation of the radical then you get your oxygen-oxygen bond in your system. The role of the chlorides, um, so this, you can read all this. The role, the role of the chlorides, it seems to be involved in this deprotonation, as I said. Um, so there you go. This is thanks to my co-workers and my fellow researchers. Co-workers, that we talk, I've talked about Alan Bushlack a lot in this. He's worked with me on this for many years. After he did his PhD, he came to work with me in Saclay. 
Um, I've been working more recently with Vili Kyler on calculations and Ishikita on calculations to do this kind of thing. These are the people that fund. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very sorry that I've gone over time. Thank you.